whether this is your first Sunday or you've been here for 30 years, we're supposed to be a community of believers. A community of believers that lives life together. That's so deeply involved in each other's lives that we know where each of us struggle, where each of us succeed, where each of us grow or need to grow. We're supposed to be a community of men and women who are moving together in the same direction, asking what does it mean to live in this world and follow Jesus? Followers of Jesus who are in actual relationship with each other and involving other people in that same community. And again, if you're new to this church, or to this particular series, the core of what we've been discussing and what we've been talking about is, as a Christian is not just supposed to attend a service, but we're supposed to share life with other believers. That there are things that need to happen face to face in the life of Christians that can't happen while you're sitting shoulder to shoulder. That we have to be in each other's lives. You might ask, well, why is sharing life with other believers such a big deal? Here's why. Because all of us, we all drift. It's easy for us. It's almost the default for us. We naturally drift away from everything that is holy and everything that is true. Have you ever noticed that? That you never drift in a good direction personally or spiritually. You always drift in a negative direction. That simply this, if it's good for us, we drift from it. If it's good for me spiritually, if it's good for me with my health, if it's good for me in any way of life, my natural tendency is to drift away from it instead of drift towards it. And I might not even know you this morning, but I know this is true in your life as it's true in my life. We naturally drift this way. You don't drift into healthy relationships. If you want to be in a healthy relationship, you have to be intentional. When we drift relationally, we always drift in bad directions. Because we all have a tendency to drift, and drifting is, is never good for us. And that intersects with our relationship with God. Our relationship with God takes some intentionality, and our relationship with God takes some time. But if you've ever noticed this in your spiritual life, I know I've noticed it in mine. I don't drift towards a strong, healthy, rooted relationship in God. My natural tendency is to drift from it. We all drift. So consequently, if we're not intentional in our relationship with God, it begins to drift because the gravitational pull of life is always the wrong direction. Here's this statement here that's in your notes. It's also on the screen. The current of life never takes us in the right direction. In every area of life that's important to you and I, it's like we're going upstream. We're going against the current. We're swimming upstream. It's not a natural drift for us. It's never easy. It's never if we just put ourselves in neutral that we'll drift to the right place. Whether you're trying to have a healthy marriage or a healthy relationship with your children if you're trying to overcome bitter or angerness or deal with a difficult boss or a difficult work relationship or pursue a relationship with God in a culture that is anti-God, in every area of life that's important, it's an upstream fight. But here's what you and I both know. It's worth it. One of the core values of Christianity one of the core values of the church is that when it comes to swimming upstream, when it comes to going against the current of culture, against the current of life, against the current of what is natural for you or natural for me, when it comes to going against the stream, 
Here's one of the core values. We have not been called to swim alone. We've been called to swim together. That you and I are not supposed to go against the current of our life, to push against the current of our life all on our own. We have other people with us, called to be in community with us. Today, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter number three. Before we actually get to the verse, I want to let you know that in the first century when the church began, what we're talking about today was an issue. In fact, the first century writer of Hebrews, we don't exactly know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but we do know that God spoke through that individual through inspiration. But after writing it, copies and copies were made and it was collected and it became part of the New Testament documents. And the book of Hebrews talks about the importance of community and specifically it talks about the issue of not swimming upstream alone, not going against the current alone. So here's what the writer tells us in verse number 12. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Before we get too far into this verse, I want you to see this. First two words, watch out. This isn't beware. This isn't don't step on that. This isn't watch what you're doing because you might make a mistake. No, it means to make sure that you do this. Make sure this happens. Now, who in their right mind would turn away from the living God? Hey, make sure you don't turn away from the living God is what the writer is saying. And we would ask, who would turn away from the Lord? I mean, who in their right mind would know the difference between right and the difference between wrong and know what God wants us to do and just choose to do the wrong thing? Who would do that? I already see some of your faces. Yeah, we would. We choose that. We choose that not because that's what we think is better. We choose that because that's the natural gravitational pull. We drift in that direction. We drift to that place. The author is saying, see to it that none of you have an unbelieving, sinful heart that turns away. In other words, he's recognized the fact that you and I have the capacity Regardless of what we believe, regardless of how long we've believed, we each have the capacity to turn away from the living God. And you say, well, Anthony, I I would never turn away from God. That's what Peter said. That's what Peter said. And just hours later, we see what he did. This first century writer knew the people that knew the risen Jesus. He knew that he was writing to people that knew the risen Jesus and that regardless of what happened, that they have the capacity to turn their back on God. Now, please, before we get too far into the message, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about someone losing their salvation. You cannot lose what God keeps. Your salvation is not up to you. My salvation is not up to me. It's held and it is secure by almighty God himself. I'm talking about someone deciding not to follow Jesus. These two things are not the same. See, some have tried to use the passage that we're in to suggest that some can lose their salvation and they're not reading it correctly, they're misinterpreting it, they're not seeing it in its context and we'll address that later on at the end of the message. But the interesting thing is this. In this verse, the solution to drifting and the solution to the problem of being tempted to turn back on God when things are difficult, the solution is the same. The solution in this verse is not an individual imperative. It's not an individual command. It's an all-inclusive command. This is a group command. Notice the plurals. I'll read it to you again. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. This is a plural thing. This is not an individual thing. All of us 
need to see about each other to make sure that we don't have an unbelieving heart because the heart that turns away from God is something that happens within all of us. The turn from God, it doesn't start on the outside. It's not simply because of a temptation. The heart that turns away from God, it starts here on the inside where no one can see, where nobody knows. Or unless you're close in someone's life, you can't predict it. When we begin to turn from God, we begin to lose interest. We begin to drift. And the drift always begins, not on the outside, but the drift begins within. And the drift begins with a temptation. And the drift begins with a doubt. And the drift always begins within. And nobody knows unless, unless what the verse says, Somebody is watching out for you, checking up on you. So nobody knows unless somebody knows you. A drifting heart doesn't reveal itself in a church service. It doesn't reveal itself in a pew. It doesn't reveal itself in a casual conversation in the lobby. That's why one of the most important functions of the church cannot happen inside of this room, even inside of this building. It's why we're commanded to be in the lives of each other because someone noticing your heart or you noticing someone else's heart that's drifting doesn't happen while you're sitting shoulder to shoulder facing one direction. It happens because you're in each other's lives and you recognize that person and you see it. And the only way that somebody is going to know about your sinful, unbelieving, drifting heart or my sinful, unbelievable, unbelieving, drifting heart is if they're sharing life with us. Look at the next verse, verse number 13. I'm only going to show you part of the verse, but encourage each other. Now, this little Greek word, encourage, does not mean encourage like, way to go, I'm cheering you on, I need to be your biggest fan. No, that's not the kind of encourage that we're talking about. In this capacity, in this context, this little Greek word translated encourage actually means to appeal, to urge strongly, to beg, to implore. What the verse is saying is this, I want you to be in each other's lives and I want you to know what's going on and I want you to be able to detect when somebody begins to drift. I want you to be in each other's lives in such a way that when something goes awry, when something goes sideways, when somebody begins to drift, that drift from within that somebody notices has access and permission to speak into your life. And you wonder, well, how often are we supposed to do that? How often is that supposed to happen? I mean, how many fellowships can we really have within a church? And how many times can a small group get together? And how many times can something happen? How often are we supposed to encourage, to urge each other, to push each other on? How often is that supposed to happen? Look at the next word, daily. We're supposed to do this daily. It literally means day after day after day after day. It means that it should be an ongoing thing. That this is relational, that people have access to you. Now, you're not going to see it yet. I'm going to show you the slide in, in just a moment. And the next part of the verse is a reference to the fact that we live in an age where where we constantly need this kind of encouragement. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, as long as you're alive and as long as you're breathing air and as long as this generation of people continue to struggle with sin and struggle with temptation, you need to be in one another's lives. And then he goes from there and he gives us what's called in the Greek a purpose statement. It's this little Greek word that indicates that the author is going to give the purpose for everything that came before and what he said. Here's that purpose statement. But encourage each other daily while it is still called today. Here's the purpose statement. So that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. We need to be in each other's lives. Why? What's the purpose? So that none of us is hardened by sin's deception. 
outside of the grace of God working through you and the power of God in your life, you're not immune to being deceived by sin. I am not immune to being deceived by sin. The problem is, is that we've spent 30 years in church or 25 years in church or 20 years in church and all of a sudden we think we've had enough church that we should be strong enough to handle life on our own. Let me help you with a big theological thing real fast, okay? You and I, this side of being given a glorified body, will never be strong enough to handle life on our own. It's by faith in his grace that works in us and through us and not of ourselves. We need him. The New Testament. The New Testament writer, especially the Apostle Paul, would describe sin, would personify sin which means that the, they would talk about sin as is as if it's a living entity, almost like it's a person living inside of us. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like sin lives inside of me. And you might say, wow, what kind of pastor are you? Sometimes I think the worst kind, if we're going to be fair, okay? But at least I have good company because the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter number seven says, hey, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I do not want to do, the things that I don't want to be a part of, those are the things that I do. And he says this about himself. He goes, what a wicked man I am. Hey, that's you. That's me. The Apostle Paul talks about sin living inside of us. That ought to completely describe who we are because there is this new nature when we were born again. If you've put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were given a new nature. But there's this old nature that's still there, the flesh. And the two war against each other. And here's what the writer is saying in this text. They're saying that the best defense against self-deceit, the best defense against talking ourselves into sin and out of wise things and out of good things, the best defense to not drifting in the wrong direction, the best defense is not you. And it's not me. The best defense is the spirit of God using the church body. The best defense for you when you're rejecting the spirit of God, when you're not listening, the best defense for you is the church body. Let me say it like this. The best defense against the deceitfulness of sin in you, it's not you, it's the church. The best defense, the best thing that you have when you're telling yourself something that isn't true are the people sitting next to you. The best defense that you have when you're believing lies that your flesh is telling you or you're believing lies that the enemy is telling you, you're not the best defense. In fact, you and I, for ourselves, we're the worst defense because we naturally drift. But the best defense, maybe the person sitting next to you, if they're walking with God and they know God and they're living in his grace and they love you and they're so deeply involved in your life that they see that when you're drifting and they know that when the drift begins, that they're able to see and point it out. Because the drift, it always happens here. It happens right here in our heart. And it makes its way into my real world. And here's what the author is saying of Hebrews. If you allow someone in while the sin, while the temptation is still within, it will keep you from sin and will keep you from things that you regret later. But it might mean some humility. And it might mean somebody being vulnerable. 
That might mean somebody letting someone in when you go, well, I just don't let people in. There's a different word for that. And this might hurt a little bit, but it comes in love. It's called pride. Because if God has commanded us and he has given us a solution, then why wouldn't we wholeheartedly lean into what he has said when he loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us, that he redeems us, that he's given us a new life in him. And he says, hey, listen, I've given you this whole other family. I've given you people who love you and care about you. So live in community together. Why wouldn't we do that? I have a couple of thoughts for you. I have a couple of thoughts that I'll give you real quick. The first one is this. Someone can see what you can't see. Why should I let somebody in my life? Why do I need what you're talking about? Because somebody can see what you can't see. Somebody who walks with God can see when sin has a hold of you. Someone who doesn't walk with God can't see when sin has a hold of you. And we have this thing within us that we always want to pick the people in our life who are going to allow us to live the way that we want to live. And what if we step outside of what we've always done and we found someone whose faith we admire, we found someone whose walk with God we admire, and we say, hey, would you be a part of my life? Because I tend to drift. It might take some humility. It might feel a little bit awkward. But this, this is what's so beautiful about the church. This is why the church isn't an entity that as soon as we change the carpet and you don't like the color of the carpet that you go and you find a new church, this is why that scenario is so wrong because we're supposed to be so embedded in each other's lives that we're walking together and pointing each other towards following Jesus and we're grounded in the word of God and we're grounded in the truth of God because none of those preferential things matter. But when you're not grounded in the word of God and you're not grounded in the truth of God and you're not grounded in relationship with each other that's where the common ground is following Jesus, it's incredible how fast all of the preferential things of life become important to us. Someone can see what you can't see. This is a spiritual leading of God. This isn't simply because they love you though their love for you will be evident. But as a believer who walks with God, not only loves you, but also sees when sin has a hold of you, you've got to let someone in your life because they'll see what you can't see. And we have the ability to make the most ridiculous ideas seem like the best decisions. We have the potential to make decisions that are self-destructive, make decisions that we think are rooted in wisdom that aren't. We have the ability to say that we've prayed about something when we haven't spent one moment in prayer in weeks. To think that I can always see clearly in my life is a viewpoint rooted in pride. The end result is you and I need someone in our lives because they see what we can't see. The second thought is this. No one intends to walk away. No one intends to turn their back on the Lord. No one intends to do that. We all have the capacity to give in to an unbelieving heart. You say, Anthony, again, that's not me. Do you know what your lack of faith is and what my lack of faith is? Yeah, that's an unbelieving heart. But I said I'd come back to this. Verse 16 isn't referring to salvation. Believing that it is referring to salvation has led many people into doctrinal error. And this is talking about everything that God has for you and for me in the Christian life. And so I'd encourage you later on, go back and read the verses 16 through 19. But I want you to remember this, none of the Israelites that you're going to read about in those verses left Egypt to die in the wilderness. They were expecting to enter into the promised land, but they didn't. And the reason is, is because of their unbelief. They were freed from bondage, but never experienced all of what God had for them in this life. No one expects to walk away. 
believing heart trusts God and walks by faith, but an unbelieving heart drifts and is unbelieving. One of the guards to our unbelieving heart needs to be guarded by people who are walking and living by faith. Get this, people who walk with God know how to encourage you. And they know how to detect when sin is in your life. And there's a difference between helping someone do better and helping someone follow Jesus. The difference is a person who knows God and walks with God and is in the word of God. Here's the third thing. God has placed people around you. This point is rather simple. You and I have no excuse. You're surrounded by people right now, whether you know them or not, who would willfully and gladly pour into your life. And you're surrounded by people right now who would willfully and gladly allow you to pour into their life. So let me ask you a question that I asked a few weeks ago. Whose life are you pouring into? Whose life are you pouring into? And who's pouring into your life? Because if you're not pouring into anyone else's life and no one's pouring into your life and you're just coming in Sunday after Sunday and you're sitting down in the seat and you're singing the songs and you're looking up at me or you're looking up at whoever's preaching, then who's watching out for your unbelieving heart that is prone to drift? And you might say, well, no one needs to look out for my unbelieving heart that's prone to drift. Word of God says otherwise. Who's looking out for you? Who's walking through life with you? I can tell you, I have people, I'm so thankful for some good friends that I have in this church who have called me multiple times this week. Hey, how are you doing? How's everything going? I say, Anthony, what are you walking through right now? I'm actually okay right now. I'm doing great. But I'm so glad I've got people pouring into my life. Because I'm not exempt for what, from what I'm telling you, you need. Because you're not the only one that needs it. We need it. We need someone watching out for us. We need someone pouring into us and we need to be pouring in to other people. So hey, church, let's go be the church. Let's do what the church does because the church does more than sit in this room and look this direction and sing words off of these screens and read scripture off of these screens and listen to someone speak, though those are all vitally important. The role and the job of the church, the design of the church, isn't finished. There's still so much more for us to do. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you're so good. Father, thank you for how good you are, for how you love us, how you care for us. Lord, would you help us as a church body to pour into each other, to look out for each other, to care for each other in such a way that we live out the truth of the verses that we've studied this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.